easy. And we're um, very excited about tonight. Um, this really, for those of you who saw our previous webinar last August, uh, the theme of that was tracking fertility, tracking health. And we talked about the fact that um, a woman's fertility is often uh, inextricably linked to her general health. And so we thought we'd take that sort of idea that keeping a chart can be a window into a woman's general health, but talk about it perhaps now from a doctor's point of view. As, as a teacher, when I find a woman with a chart I think is showing um, some, some signs that I think need uh, medical investigation, I'll send them off to a doctor. And our doctor here tonight who's going to give us an insight is Dr Mary Walsh. I've known Mary for many years uh, and she's a, a, a wonderful compatriot in the area of um, holistic medicine and women's health care. Mary is a GP in, in general practice here in Melbourne. And as part of her practice, um, she's instituted a, what she calls a fertility assessment clinic. So welcome, Mary. Thank you, Lynn. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And lovely um, to see so many people. It is. It's lovely, isn't it? I'm wondering, first of all, if you could just tell us what you do at the Fertility Assessment Clinic and, and perhaps why you thought it was um, a good idea to start this. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, so I decided to start the Fertility Assessment Clinic about 10 years ago um, to get involved in that whole space of helping women and couples uh, be able to more easily access um, fertility awareness um, knowledge, as well as a medical um, consultation. Um, there were other doctors around Australia involved in doing um, fertility work with, with patients, uh, none of which were involved in a, a medical practice, but I was involved in a large practice and I thought I could Put them, put it to them to have a general special interest or special interest clinic in the, within the practice that incorporated fertility awareness teacher as well as um, the medical approach. Um, it you know it grew out of a realization that it's so difficult for couples who aren't interested in um, the traditional gynaecological approach, which um, is taught to doctors these days, which is really based around. Um, you know, chemical um, medical contraception techniques for avoiding pregnancy and then um, in vitro fertilization assisted reproductive technology for fertility. So if a couple goes to a GP with that problem of a reproductive health issue, they're very quickly um, referred into um, a specialty where the the um, easiest opportunities to do ART and it seems it was it felt to me very unfortunate knowing as I did the benefits of couples um, understanding their fertility and working with their fertility and I guess retrospectively too knowing the work that um, had been done by the Billings teachers in retrospectively looking at their success rates with couples learning fertility um, and um, how how successful those couples were over a, a two-year period. I think it was over 50% of them managed to achieve a pregnancy. So even without medical intervention, um, sometimes uh, just, just learning how to maximise uh, your chances of conceiving for the subfertile couple um, was so important. So... Um, so when I start, I always had um, a, a Billings teacher working in a clinic where I was working, which was Joan Clements, who you all um, probably no very senior experienced teacher. And when we moved to this new centre um, and opened the fertility assessment clinic, Joan actually came along and was in the room next to me when I was seeing the couples. And so there was an opportunity then for, then for them to learn the method straight away if they wanted to, and for her to um, have appointments with couples um, in the medical centre. So it, it really... Um, gave it a profile that was helpful, I thought. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, then, and that's a wonderful opportunity for people where, where they can come and see you and all of those services that they might need are 
they're on site. They don't have to make another appointment and go somewhere else. It's all there for them. Yes, yes. And that, you know, over the years it changed. We, um, Dr Lucia Manane, eventually a couple of years after I started, came along and um, joined me and then Dr David Anderson. So we had three doctors um, and with different uh, uh, well, trainings in a way they, they had also done, apart from Billings um, training, they had done some NAPRO technology training as well. And um, so they were there. Um, Lucia has now moved to another clinic. But, uh, and the whole, the, interestingly, over, the, over time, and of course with COVID as well, the couples were, and you've all seen this, I'm sure, couples using more um, uh, virtual access to knowledge so apps and and uh, so now um, in an RBA took over after Joan retired and she doesn't come in anymore but we refer to fertility pinpoint and and the apps and and do the training that way so it's still obviously I try and get face-to-face -face consultations when we can but um, a lot of couples are now much more used to online teaching aren't they so yeah, I think COVID's changed a lot of parameters for for teaching and, and for all sorts of mm. services, not not only in, in the area of medical services, but in all sorts of services. So why the interest in fertility awareness and natural family planning, Mary? Yeah, it's always a long story, interestingly, <laughs> isn't it? Um, I guess it goes back to, I remember very vividly when I was a young medical student, um, being very conscious of the embryo. I actually, I had a specific interest in wanting to protect the embryo as that em early embryonic life. So I was quite involved in um, pro-life and pregnancy help activities um, as a medical student. Um, and then when we were doing gynecology, it came to that whole um, section of gynecology where you learn about um, fertility and managing um, endocrine issues and I remember being very concerned about um, why would you if you had a natural way of assessing your fertility and working with periods of fertility and infertility why would you want to take you know chemicals um, or medication to firstly to suppress it and also to potentially give you side effects so um, I thought that was a little bit strange and they only all they talked about really was taking your temperature after ovulation to see whether you were ovulating so I remember taking my temperature for a couple of cycles and finding that a bit tedious <laughs> thinking hoping there was something better um, and then uh, but I don't recall them there was no talk about a fertility you know it was all um it was all rhythm in those days really um talking about timing and the the which they often still mention sort of, or talk about poor success rates, which is not um, not true anymore. And it's certainly not rhythm anymore. It's, it's very scientifically validated now. So when I got married and um, came to Melbourne, um, uh, my husband who was a bioethicist uh, took me to a lecture given by Drs. John and Lynn Billings. And that was a, um, a light bulb moment when I was hearing Dr. John talking about um, not only respect for the embryo, but respect for the beginnings of life and how it all went back to that respect for the origins of life, for, the, for conception. In, and in that, that was embedded in this respect for women's and men's fertility and that holistic approach to their, um, to their relationship. Um, and that just made perfect sense to me. And there was no temperature taking, so I was sold. <laughs> you know, it, it, there you had, in, in essence, a method that was, for most women, going to be uh, accessible, understandable um, and manageable and something that encouraged um, communication with within the relationship as well and cooperation. Um, so from then on, you know, you, you learn as you go along and you realise, yeah, well, learning the charting the method is normal chart, sign of good health. An abnormal chart gives you a, a good barometer of general health and especially reproductive health. So, um, and that all started from there, really. Um, yes, I, I think, um, I think 
Dr. Jordan had a profound effect on a lot of people, <laughs> more so than we perhaps realised at the time. Yes. He was a wonderful, he was a wonderful speaker, a wonderful orator. He he could spin an argument on the on the tip of his finger. He was such an intelligent and, and articulate man. Yes, so very inspiring um, as a couple. And um, I know the stories of their involvement in coming into learning about the method and, and, and developing it. Uh, was extraordinary and Dr Lynn's um, involvement really um, helped enormously with the female and the comp more complicated um, issues that some women cope with. And then I met, you know, uh, Professor Brown and Dr Oda Blad and there were, it was just an, a wonderful um, collaboration that was uh, set to evaluate this um, gift that's, that's within the, the, the female cycle and um, it was a yeah. wonderful little collaborative community, wasn't it? It was extraordinary. And, and they, they, those three men fed off each other's disciplines mm. very easily, very naturally, and they had a wonderful relationship with each other. They yes. Really yeah. And such a complimentary um, trio, you know, the, the charting, uh, and Dr. Professor Brown with the analysing the hormones and, and, and then Professor Oderblad with the analysis of the cervical mucus was an extraordinary collaboration that um, was a great gift to, to women and women's health and men's so, health well, that too. That was sort of going to be my next question. I suppose that really led you into this interest in women's health and fertility. It's, it's all linked, isn't it? It certainly is, and I think that becomes very clear when you see a normal chart. You think, "Good, yeah, that's a good, normal, healthy-looking chart." Um, when you see an abnormal chart, you immediately think, "Oh no, there's there's something really not right here." And over the years, of course, the, the um, now decades of, of research and looking into the um, hormonal uh, control of of the and. Uh, uh, the anatomical issues as well involved with with charting and with the women's cycle um, have revealed that that's really true that the the cycle is a real barometer of of health and uh, the mucus in itself is a barometer of the hormones that, that fluctuate throughout the cycle uh, and I, I always find that a really valuable thing to tell to tell women when they're learning is that, you know, look at this. We know the estrogen's rising here and look, there you've got that uh, mucus that's come in and we know the progesterone's rising here and there you go, the mucus has gone away. You know, it's that in a simple way is, is a barometer of hormonal health. But um, when you uh, look at the total picture of all of the other things that happen in a cycle, then, you know, you know that um, there are within that chart that we see there are clues and um, opportunities to uh, find out what's what's causing the problems that we see when we see an abnormal chart so um, it's always I find it very exciting when someone comes in with a chart because I know they're you know they're on a good learning curve of of understanding their body and and helping to to uh, find out what issues might need to be addressed Fantastic. And, and the other thing I must remember to not forget to mention too is the men's health. I think that's an important part of the medical approach in all of this is that we see the men as well and they often don't get a, much of a look in so and often reluctant to come. So if they can, the men turn up as well, <laughs> it's a bonus. Um, and that's one, that's one thing about... Um, methods of natural fertility awareness. And I know with the Billings Method, we always encourage the husbands to come along um, mm. if they can. It's not always possible. No. But they're as intrinsically invested in all of this being a success as their wives are. Yeah. And it just takes the weight off the woman's shoulders if she knows her husband understands what's going on and can be really supportive when she's feeling a little bit overwhelmed, perhaps by um, all the things that she's learning. Exactly. So, yeah. So it's, it's really a couple method. It's fantastic like that. Um, so one of your other hats, Mary, um, is as, um, uh, it, again, it's all linked. One of your other hats is as chair of IWRM, which is the Australian Institute of Restorative and Reproductive Medicine. So I suppose the first question is, what is restorative and reproductive medicine? Okay, restorative reproductive medicine is 
an approach probably similar to what I've just been talking about, where the aim is to um, investigate reproductive um, health and disorders and to actually restore reproductive health and fertility where possible. So sometimes it might not be possible, but the aim of, of restorative reproductive medicine is to actually thoroughly investigate um, rep reproductive health in a woman and a man where that's appropriate and with the aim of restoring it. So much of um, modern gynaecology is about bypassing sort of um, a reproductive system in a way, you know, suppressing fertility to control fertility, um, using uh, assisted reproductive technology to, to um, help where it doesn't seem to be a reason um, why someone can't conceive when in fact they, perhaps they haven't actually looked hard enough or tried um, approaches that might be useful to um, restore fertility rather than pursuing this need to you know bypass the, the normal reproductive um, health. So the institute so it's the Australian Institute of Restorative Reproductive Medicine it, it was it came out of um, a collaboration that actually started uh, it, probably in the John Paul II Institute in Melbourne. Uh, I think that's really probably where it originated in essence. Um, my husband was um, Associate Dean in Bioethics there and there was a course running um, on marriage and family studies and within that course there was a, um, uh, a course on the theology and uh, history of natural family planning, which was a collaborative effort with the three main fertility awareness uh, method teachers in Australia uh, and some medical input as well. And then a, we had a conference which brought all the bodies together and the doctors involved in restorative reproductive medicine at the time were very interested in, in collaborating. So out of that grew the, a collaboration which uh, became this institute. And so we aim now to um, be a source of education. So we have conferences, uh, webinars. Um, we um, aim to be a, a supportive collaborative environment, I suppose, if you like, for medical people interested in this area. Um, providing educational opportunities uh, in terms of trainings. Uh, we, there's several ways of training in the medical world of this of RRM now. So uh, thanks to COVID, a lot more of it is online and more accessible. Uh, Professor Pilar Vigil has a, uh, a very good course uh, with the fertility education medical management, which is available online. And then there's uh, NEPRO technology training with Professor Tom Hilgers in America. So we have funding available actually for, to help train um, doctors in that area. So the collaboration is between doctors and fertility awareness teachers of the three methods and any allied health individuals, psychologists, dietitians, um, uh, bioethicists, anybody with a particular interest in this area are welcome to be part of the collaboration. So we aim to be a source of information for the public as well as um, provide that um, focus um, and support for each other as well in this in this space. And the other thing I'll just mention too is what's happened over the years is this there has been a, a wonderful growth globally um, and now uh, I, and partly, again, because of COVID and the uh, change to online learning, we have a, a great global community of for restorative reproductive medicine, um, doctors, teachers, allied health personnel, and there are a lot of um, collaborative efforts uh, that are very helpful and very promising for the future, I think. Sounds absolutely wonderful, Mary. And this really is um, where our sort of disciplines come together because as a Billings Ovulation Method teacher, I'm also a member of AIRRM. And that's one of the wonderful things about the organisation is that it brings together like-minded doctors, health professionals, um, um, practitioners from all of the natural family planning methods um, into one group um, because really we're all working towards the same thing. And it's 
fantastic to have a like-minded group of people because we can get so much more done when we're all working together than we're than beavering away in our own little areas. If we combine all of that knowledge and all of that um, goodwill, um, I think we can get a lot more done. So um, that's another, you know, lovely um, convergence of medicine and um, natural family planning. Yeah, and I think too, it, it's it's for the good of um, you know people out there who are looking for support. So we do have a a list um, on the the website which we're hope, we're updating hopefully, but. Um, so that people who, who might want to access a teacher uh, somewhere, you know, in their world, in Australia especially, or Australasia, because we do include New Zealand, um, and also doctors, uh, so that the website has that ability to provide support, you know, contact details. So, And it's great because I might be, I mean, as you said, with, with COVID, we're doing a lot more teaching online. And so... I might be teaching somebody from interstate and I can't very well, as much as I would like to, refer them to you. So I've got to find a doctor in their state or their area to whom I can refer. And that's where this, this service that AIRRM offers of, of listing the practitioners in different states is really, really helpful from a teaching point of view. Mm, yeah, good. Um, I wonder whether I've, I've got a couple of little charts here that I thought we might have a look at. Mm -hmm. And just from a, from a, a medical perspective, um, just get you to sort of say what, what you see in the chart and what you're looking for when you, when you look at a chart and how that chart can help you when you're trying to um, uh, help a couple. What sort of clues is the chart going to give you? So I'll just bring up that little... PowerPoint now. This is the first chart. And for those of our audience who are familiar with the Billings Ovulation Method chart, um, women will each day keep a record of two symptoms. One is the sensation she notices at the mother, the other is the discharge that she sees. So this particular woman has noted that she's bleeding here, it's making her feel wet. And then all of these yellow boxes, this woman, it's an unchanging pattern. Things are the same every day here. Now, I've just noticed <laughs> a bit of a glitch here. You'll notice if you actually look at the, um, the chart, it says wet. And that's because there were acts of intercourse on this chart that we've taken out just to simplify it for this evening. But she had a consistent pattern of infertility all the way through here. And this is where she believes her fertility started. She believed she had an ovulation somewhere in this area here, and her next bleed was on day 35. So Mary, if a, if a patient came to you with a chart like this, what's it going to be telling you? Um, I can't, I have seen the chart. I, don't, oh, I can't see it. I don't know whether, if, no, can everybody see it? No, you no. can't either because you know what I've done. I've forgotten to share my screen. <laughs> it's really not going to be a help if I don't share the screen. There we go. Oh, oh that's better. Will be when I actually. There we go. Can you see that now, Mary? Yes, I can see it now. Can everybody else see it? Too? I yeah. hope so. Yeah, good. <laughs> So, I guess so. What, um, what if I saw this chart? I would think, well, uh, the bleeding is confined to the period, so that's good. The basic infertile pattern looks consistently the same, which is good, um, well identified, and there's you know quite a good change to of, of the mucus symptom. And a good pickup of the, of the sensation of slippery and wet, and then a, a good change back to sticky. Um, so that's all good. There's no sort of spotting or uh, abnormal um, abnormalities in that aspect of it. The um, the length of the, the 
the, the peak days were recognised, um, which is a good thing. The time from the peak day to the onset of bleeding is, uh, what is it, 10, 10 days. So that's yes. a, um, a question mark, uh, whether that length of time that um, of that luteal phase is, is adequate. Um, Professor Vig, Vigil would say that without hormonal recommend, uh, measurements, you know, the time of ovulation can be from minus two from peak to, to up to three. So the definition of a short luteal phase is a bit dependent on um, if you've got the uh, hormones or not in a way. Otherwise, it's, uh, it should be at least 11, 11 to 16 days. So there's a query over that and what what is what's the issue with that shortened luteal phase so how would you how would you verify what was going on mary well what we would aim to do would be to assess the hormonal well several things i suppose um we'd verify this with a few more cycles i guess uh we would would be great to have a hormonal profile of a cycle so that we can check the levels of progesterone um because i presume i guess the audience is varied but most of the audience may know that for the um from the time of bleeding through to the change uh in the sensation there from sticky to um not sticky to wet the hormone levels of estrogen and progesterone are quite low but once the estrogen rises in response to the developing follicles in the ovary the cervix um, is stimulated to release a mucus that is uh, tends to be um, clear and stretchy and, and is what is needed for sperm survival um, and then that that rises to a, a peak uh, and then just before ovulation and the egg is released the progesterone will start to rise and a good rise in progesterone will um, last for seven days reach a certain amount of a, a good level of progesterone and then fall gradually to give you a, a luteal phase length longer than um, 11 days so the up until ovulation or up until the time of the change the estrogen and progesterone levels are low the estrogen rises and falls and then the progesterone rises so the progesterone will only rise if ovulation has happened um, or attempted ovulation has happened and so we would aim to do progesterone levels to confirm the, how good the, the um, hormonal changes are in that cycle so we'd check the levels that usually around um, sometimes around day three or four but usually around day seven and uh, nine and eleven and get an idea of um, how good those changes are oh i'm sorry <laughs> so mary i'm just going to keep talking i'm just going to yeah so further assessment would depend on uh what other issues were involved in the consultation really um, other symptoms that she might have or um, what we find in in assessing this the cycle it's interesting you're talking about um assessing the levels of progesterone because um i know I often tell my clients if we if we ask them to go back to the doctor and get some blood tests done we know that a lot of doctors who who aren't very familiar with um, a woman keeping a chart, will routinely take a progesterone or a blood test on day 21. Why do they do that, Mary? They do that because, um, the, you know, the teaching is the average cycle is 28 days and ovulation it occurs on day 14. But we know that a very low percentage of women actually ovulate on day 14. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what tends to to be taught and what sticks in doctors heads i think is day 14 <laughs> is the day of population so um seven days after that it's day 21 therefore you know it should be you should be able to see whether someone's ovulated by doing a day 21 progesterone but you can see from this chart that she hasn't ovulated till after day 21 so 
if you do a day it's 21 nice. progesterone there, it's going to be low. And, uh, and she's likely going to be told she's not ovulating. Exactly. That's right. Yes. Which is totally incorrect. Which is use, not useful. Yes. <laughs> that's right. 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 And you can imagine, this. we, we, we had quite a few accident course here, as I said before. We only had one accident course here it was either day 23 or 24. Um, and the reason um, why there was only one act of intercourse in the fertile phase, this couple were trying to achieve. Um, and we just happened to have the hormones. Mary, you might be interested oh, in having a look. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the reason why this couple had intercourse around here was because their hormones were being monitored and their, their teacher said to them, you're, your estrogen is almost at its peak, your, your progesterone is starting to rise, have intercourse. Um, I don't know what the outcome, well, no, well, we know they wouldn't have become pregnant because of the short luteal phase. But they did, in fact, uh, the woman did, in fact, ovulate. It wasn't an infertile cycle. Mm. But what does that short luteal phase tell us about the ovulation, Mary? Is it likely that this sort of a situation will ever lead to a pregnancy? Yes, if a woman consistently has short luteal phases um, and she's in you know, the right age um, to be having, where she should be having regular healthy cycles, then it would be a clue to start you know, doing full investigations, um, which what we would do normally then would be um, a full hormonal assessment done on day, around day three to five of the cycle. So that, that involves... Um, you know, the general blood tests, um, looking at general health issues. So full blood counts, iron levels, um, uh, vitamin D is particularly important these days with a lot of us being inside a lot more. And vitamin D is a very important hormone um, related to fertility and general health. Um, we'd have to do a general endocrino endocrinological assessment involving um, thyroid um, prolactin levels, um, checking the adrenal glands for any abnormalities, um, and in, and also we we do look for insulin levels, so insulin resistance, which with a glucose tolerance test and insulin levels, just because we know a high insulin is a, a problem for um, abnormal cycles as well. Um, so that would be the you know and other in looking for inflammatory markers um, that might be elevated pointing to uh, uh, autoimmune disease. There are many, many areas um, that need to be um, thought about with, with a deficient luteal phase. Is it, you know, premature ovarian aging in a 35 year old mm -hmm. or a younger woman? Is it, you know, uh, yeah, all sorts of things, but probably, um, the most, yeah, I guess the most common would probably be thyroid levels being a bit abnormal or um, high prolactin or vitamin D deficiency, those sorts of things. Iron deficiency contributes as well. Interesting. But um, I think it's just, I think it's just so helpful um, that such a, a simple chart, something that's relatively simple for a woman to do, um, can give you so much insight into where to look. Exactly. Um, it, uh, it is amazing and it's, it's so uh, concerning really that it's not, um, not more readily taught and the information isn't more readily available to women. Um, I know studies have been done on women's knowledge and I think something like they did a study on women coming to general practice and I think 2% were able to identify um, their fertility and I think in people going to a, a ART clinics of something like 12% of women whereas 90% of women wanted this sort of information when they first started having trouble um, with their periods or with conceiving mm -hmm. so it's still after all these years it's still so difficult to uh, make it Although I do think it's getting better. I think there is a move towards more natural. Um, 
less intervention. Less intervention, intervention. People wanting a more natural approach, a healthier approach, more sustainable approach. So mm. it's growing <laughs> in different <laughs> ways. But yeah, it is amazing what just this basic understanding of of your body and the symptoms that are there can um, can give give couples an insight. Look, I think insight is a huge thing too. If for couples just to know that, that you know this is what's going on rather than not having a clue about the time of their cycle and what what the changes are and what it means for them and that leads to a sense of powerlessness doesn't it which it does really yeah. demoralizing and defeating yes um, yeah no, i think you know you can see light bulbs going off in for women when can't you as teachers i know you yeah. you you see that where women go, oh, is that what it's about? Is that what it means? That discharge that I thought was a real problem is actually what it, what's needed to be there and why it's there. And yeah, exactly, it, it is. It is a real. They go, oh, and you can. There's it's not, it's not relief, but it's just this wonderful awakening that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now I get what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And then the ones who come in and say, well, this was my normal cycle for all these months, but now look what's happening. You know, I'm getting this or this and something's not right. And mm. yeah, let's have a look and see what we can find out. The other issue I, I just wanted to raise with you too, Mary, is that there's so much um, focus these days on, on fertility or, or the lack thereof, where we seem to have a rising infertility rate um, along across most Western um, countries. Um, but everybody seems to think that that can be solved by just going to IVF and you'll have a baby. And to a degree, that is correct. You know, about a third of couples walk away from IVF with a, a healthy live baby. But there's more to fixing these problems than just getting a baby, isn't there? Um, well, I think that's always um, my feeling. I think we know now, studies have shown that there are a lot of couples who find um, going through the IVF process very stressful. Um, we know that often... Um, couples aren't fully investigated for health issues um, that may contrib be contributing to their um, problems. Um, infertility in itself or subfertility has been studied in terms of psychological distress and they know that it's it rates up there with having a diagnosis of cancer or heart disease in terms of general health and psychological um, suffering so it's it's a very stressful time anyway not struggling to get pregnant or having a recurrent miscarriage it's it's yes. it is a very very difficult um, thing to go through and unfortunately for the couples that um, perhaps go through IVF they they have there are added added stresses you know it's it's invasive there are uh, it's fairly strong drugs, which, you know, are also used in restorative reproductive medicine as in ovulation induction. But um, there's an element of um, intrusion uh, in IVF that they couples have to go through. They're faced with the ethical dilemmas, I think, also of, um, you know, freezing embryos and then how to manage all of that in time. So there are added pressures. We know there is a, um, studies have shown that over time, and I think the clinics are getting better at this, you know, they used to put in, put back in multiple embryos and there were lower birth weights, there were premature births, there were more problems for the babies. Um, and I think that's still an issue, but it's, they're addressing that a bit, a bit more. But so, um, but we do know that there are, slightly higher rates of, of some congenital abnormalities. And they, there are some concerns now too about the epigenetic changes. So for the, the offspring that there may be some uh, long-term health issues that we don't, aren't fully investigated as, as yet. Um, and then 
for the couple, of course, if, if they're not properly investigated before they start IVF, even that's not going to be helpful for them to get pregnant during IVF anyway. Mm. And then they're still left with these health conditions. Um, and I think that's the hidden cost of, um, of ART um, yeah. in the sense that the, whatever was causing the problem in the first place is still there. Yes, even often after they have the baby, and that that can predispose them to other health conditions later in life, can't it? Yes, that's right. And and things like if you know if things like insulin resistance, um, overweight, obesity, or prediabetes aren't corrected in the in both the father and the mother, then that leaves the child at risk. They know now for developing those conditions as well. So. And I mean, that's similar for natural fertility too, in a, in a sense, but it's anecdotally um, from the, some of the hospitals, we know that um, they, they do have couples, women coming in with pregnancies from ART where there are health concerns that haven't been, haven't been addressed. So, and psychologically, I, I don't know, I think it's, it can be, um, we, our holistic approach involves psychological care as well and we try and encourage couples to really um, go into the distress that they're feeling with this journey which is a bit out of their control of, of infertility or subfertility and with recurrent miscarriage so we, we work with psychologists to really try and and have holistic psychological healing so that their parenting is better if they do become parents and so that their relationship is better but also just so that their lives are better in terms of their mm. mental health. Um, and I'm not sure that that really happens in IVF counselling. I haven't come across couples. And we do see couples who've been through IVF who come to us for help and even help with their IVF pregnancies sometimes. Um, and I, I've never found someone who said, oh, yeah, we were offered holistic psychological support of that kind. Um, so... Um, it is. It's, it's, it is a, it's a difficult journey. There's no two ways about it. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult journey. And I, I think that that's what I think a restorative approach aims to, if, even if the, the parents, if the couple doesn't end up with um, having a child or extending their family as they would like, we would hope that they are holistically healed in a sense. They've done everything they can to try and, and help it happen and have dealt with the um, feelings of grief and loss um, and stress as a couple that, that, they've, um, that, that they're going through. So that there is a sense of healing, even if the outcome uh, it may not be um, in a child, but hopefully in better health, physical and mental health, and the sense of having done everything that they can. Yeah. Another chart here for you to look at, Mary, if you wouldn't mind. Um, oh, doesn't want to. Oh, it doesn't want to move on to the next. I'll just. Sorry, I'll stop sharing and I'll go back and start it again. Okay, now let's see if we can screen share this. Technology, Lynn. Oh, it's beyond me sometimes, Mary. Uh, trouble is when I bring one up, I lose the other. Now, Do you want to tell me what the chat was? No, here we go. It's, it's oh, one it. with some... Um, here we go. Can you see that now, Mary? Yes, I can. Yeah. So I'll just make that bigger on the screen for everybody. So this is one with some abnormal bleeding that I thought you might be interested mm. to have a look at. Mm. Yes, abnormal bleeding is always a trigger for um, uh, alarm bells, really. Um, so you can see here there's some spotting after the cycle, which is too bad, but there's a lot of spotting before bleed the menstrual bleeding starts properly mm. and that's very early on in the luteal phase 
What causes that, Mary? So there are many causes for um, spotting, premenstrual spotting like that. Um, you immediately you would think perhaps is lute. Um, I haven't got the length of that cycle. I can't. It's, it's hidden. Twenty-eight days. Twenty-eight days, and the luteal phase is. It's twelve. 12 I think. Twelve days, so it's a healthy luteal phase, but with spotting. So, mm. it, it, what comes to mind is: is there a progesterone deficiency in that um, mm. luteal phase that's leading to um, some de deterioration in the endometrial lining and, and spotting? Um, endometriosis comes to mind because that that is often. Um, has one of its criteria can be premenstrual bleeding or premenstrual spotting. Um, and then you always have to think of other causes like um, you want to exclude polyps in the cervix or polyps in the endometrium or endometrial hyperplasia or um, cervical infections or cervical cancer and those sorts of mm -hmm. things or even bleeding disorders. Uh, so usually this would be followed up with um, hormonal levels. Uh, it'd have to do a, a, an examination of the cervix um, for, with a, a cervical screening test for or a pap smear, uh, maybe swabs for infection if there was other, other signs of infection, an, um, an ultrasound, gynecological ultrasound to assess the um, lining of the uterus for fibroids or polyps or endometrial overgrowth um, check the ovaries as well for any um, abnormalities uh, and uh, and looking for um, signs of endometriosis which you know, can be seen on good ultrasound sometimes not always um, yeah so it's, it's certainly a sign for more investigations to be done Okay. And interesting, I'll just go back to endometriosis. That's an interesting one with fertility. Sometimes the only sign of endometriosis for a, a woman is that she's not getting pregnant. It's extraordinary that we're finding and often the, the classical symptoms of pain and, and abnormal bleeding do happen, but they also happen to women who don't have endometriosis. Um, but some women who have no signs as in pain or heavy bleeding, but are having trouble conceiving, if you end up doing a laparoscopy to have a look, often endometriosis will be there. And once it's removed, um, it really helps fertility. Excellent. I've, got, um, I've just got a couple of statistics here, actually, that I asked you to provide for us, Mary, um, which were just having a look at um, infertility. Um, yeah, so one in six oh, couples, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening here. It will not act like a, there we go, we're just gonna have to leave it like, oh, I've got a screen share. Sorry, everybody, I do apologize. That's all right. I've... There we go, that's better. Yes, yeah, so the, the infertility statistics are um, uh, quite still, you know, quite high. One in six couples, that's a lot. And it's a couple thing. So 40% of cases, the problem is is with the woman, but 40% the problem rests with the male. So it is really, really important when there's a problem with fertility for both partners to have holistic health checks. Um, Sometimes it's a problem on both sides, so that that complicates things a bit more. But it's good that there are things that both um, both partners can do. And sometimes the, the cause isn't known. Ten percent of cause cases we can't find a cause, so unexplained infertility. So um, yeah, so it is a big issue in in terms of our population, which is why ART and IVF has become such a business. Um, offering the help that it, it does. Um, the one in 25 males having a low sperm count, I, I don't have the figures in my head, but I know that the issue of male fertility is one that um, experts in male fertility are worried about. There seems to be a great decline in, in uh, men's um, fertility over as time goes on these days for various reasons. Fantastic. Um, 
So I'll just stop sharing there. I'm wondering, time is running on a little bit. I wonder, Rachel, do we have any questions? Rachel, are you there? Sorry, I've just muted everybody. I'll have to take that off mute. I think so Rachel can unmute herself. Oh, goodness, just what have we got here? Um, there is a question here about um, where are we? Uh, will this be available offline for people unavailable at the moment? Yes, it will be. We'll be we are recording the webinar and it will be up on our um, YouTube channel. So if you've registered, you'll get uh, an email letting you know when it's available on the YouTube channel. Um, I can see a question there, Lynn. Do you? Yes. Um, do you want to go ahead and answer that, Mary? Oh, which one? <laughs> I don't know. You still become pregnant with low progesterone in the luteal phase. Um, yes, you can. Some pregnancies we pick up because when we're following monitoring people who are trying to, couples who are trying to conceive, um, we do a lot of progesterone testing and we'll, we'll sometimes pick up um, a pregnancy with a low progesterone. So it's still possible, um, but we usually recommend, highly recommend um, supplemental micronized progesterone in the form of pessaries. Um, to use to support the pregnancy. The progesterone supports the lining of the uterus, which helps to support the pregnancy. So um, studies are much more um, in favour now of supplementing progesterone um, right. in, with that, in that situation. Um, I think I can talk now. So. You can. We can <laughs> Sorry about that. that. Um, Another question was, um, what about women with polycystic ovarian syndrome? Yes. What was the question about that? I think it's whether, um, I guess, can a holistic medical approach help women with polycystic ovarian syndrome? Oh, it definitely can. Yes, polycystic ovarian syndrome is probably one of the commonest gynaecological problems for women, and that's a combination um, well, so you can have polycystic ovaries, uh, which is a greater than 20 follicle count on the ovaries. By itself, that's not diagnostic. The syndrome involves elevated um, androgen or testosterone levels for the woman. Um, and there are usually irregular cycles as well. So if you investigate women with the syndrome, you often find things like uh, insulin resistance which needs to be treated and that can be treated with um, vitamin d it low, helps to lower insulin also appropriate diet as in low carbohydrate diet increased exercise weight loss healthy diet those sorts of um, approaches um, and drugs similar to metformin which is used for diabetes that helps to lose a couple a woman to lose weight and and also lowers insulin uh, and that helps with the to hide testosterone levels as well but that needs to be um, thoroughly investigated there are surgical things that can be done too uh, and so ovarian resection or drilling and also there are drugs if the woman's not ovulating then she can be helped to ovulate with um, uh, ovulation inducing agents so there's a lot that can be done I've got another um, question here. I'm not sure whether you can see it, Rachel, so I, I might just read it out just in case. Um, uh, one of our audience is asking about a 25-year-old woman, uh, they know, who's been taking oral contraceptives for six years but hasn't had any bleeds for almost three years. And from time to time, uh, she's experiencing pain in her lower abdomen. Um, do you have any insight about this? Do you think if she drops the use of oral contraceptives, the fertility will return, or is there likely to be something else happening because of the, the pain in her lower abdomen? Well, she certainly needs to have that 
looked at if she's had no bleeding for three years um, and experiencing pain yeah she certainly needs to um, have that investigated um, certainly with a pelvic ultrasound to start with just to see if there's any issues with the ovaries or um, with the uterus but it's unusual that she hasn't had any bleeding unless she's taking continuous uh, hormones rather than having the breakthrough bleeding um, and she wouldn't know what would happen about her fertility unless she stops the contraceptive pill but um, I would imagine that needs to be sought about and investigated mm. yes, it doesn't sound wonderful does it, it doesn't sound healthy no, it no. Doesn't. yeah that's right um, so I can Any see a, a question there from a GP I'm just looking at the chat. Yeah. yeah, so a GP recommending a course to have a good start to learning more. Um, yeah, so if it depends, you know, for a, a GP, it's a really good idea to have a knowledge of fertility awareness, a method. I started with the Billings method and uh, uh, have prefer that, although, you know, all of the methods, there are similarities and you can learn knowing one thoroughly helps you understand the others um, so it, it and I think some of that is a little bit of a probably a personality choice that you make um, so it's certainly worth looking at then all of the um, the Billings Crichton Symptom Thermal all have teacher training courses in terms of medical training um, if you we there are two main ones is Professor Pilar Vigil's um, FEM training, F-E-M-M, Fertility Education Medical Management, that's online. And then there's NAPRO Technology training, which uh, involves uh, traveling to America. So options for that are available if, if you, if anyone goes to the AIRRM website, um, you will, there'll be some information there or I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. There are, as I said, funds available for doctors to, to train to in restorative reproductive medicine and would be very, very delighted if um, anybody has an interest in helping them become more familiar with fertility awareness and RRM. It will certainly benefit your practice as a GP and your patients um, greatly. I second that. There's <laughs> <laughs> another question here, which is interesting. Do you see an increased incidence of premature menopause in women who've used ART? Do you have any evidence of that? I don't. Um, specifically, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I mean, possibly one wonders because of using up, you know, with all the ovulation induction and the use of, you know, um, ovulation stimulation uh, whether there's some lo logical reason to think that that might hasten things well, I haven't seen any studies I'd be interested in them if there are some mm -hmm. another question here from uh, an audience member in Hungary hello in Hungary um, she's new to teaching um, and uh, she was interested in if a woman can detect cervical cancer in a, at an early stage by charting and what cycle pattern should warn us to this. I think probably this is more a question for me than you, Mary. <laughs> All right. um, look, we, we don't, we never say that if you see this in a chart, it means that. As teachers, we're not here to diagnose. Um, and and I think you're probably talking about cervical cancer here. And, and we do have a very famous chart that we use a lot because it does show exactly this, that a woman who knew the Billings Method well was charting <clears throat> for her own use and she'd done our training course. She didn't know what was wrong, but she knew something was wrong because she had changes to her mucus pattern that were very unusual for her. And the fact that, you know, she didn't look at it and say, well, that must be cervical cancer. But she understood that this wasn't normal for her and that it really wasn't normal in any way considering what she learned when studying the Billings Method. And she just thought, I need to go and get this seen too. 
And in that case, she did have um, cancer of the cervix. It was a very aggressive cancer, but it was treated very, very quickly. And she's, she's in remission. She's alive and well today. And I think that chart might be something like 20 years old now. So we don't look for a particular pattern and say, oh, that's cervical cancer, or that's PCO, or that's endometriosis. We just know this is not normal. And we refer on and let people like Mary who have the skills and the training uh, to do the investigation. Of course, you, it helps when you have a wonderful doctor like Mary, but certainly in, in that sort of situation, refer them on to somebody who can, don't, don't wait and hold on to them and think, oh, we'll see if it goes away. Get them onto a doctor as soon as you possibly can. Mm. Yeah, that's good advice. And I think... Um, bleeding or abnormal discharge is um, yeah, something that needs to be investigated sooner rather than later. Yeah. There's a, a, we'll just take one more question because we're, we're running 10 minutes um, uh, of the time. Here, but um, we've got a couple of, couple of questions about, um, again, PCOS and progesterone. Um, as, how does PCOS... Uh, effect determining the fertile window when periods don't occur for months at a time. Well, hopefully if the woman gets good medical treatment, her periods will return and she will have um, more fertility. But if nothing's done, you're right, she's just going to have very, very long, long spaces of time where she's got no fertility, no fertility at all or very limited fertility, which is another reason why we can't just hope that these things will, will rectify themselves. We really need to make sure that we, we care about these women and that we refer them off to doctors who we know will try and do their best. Uh, and, and that, you know, in the past, I don't know so much now, Mary, but in the past, if there was a diagnosis of PCOS, it was just, oh, well, we'll put you on the pill. That'll put everything right again. Mm. Well, it doesn't because they come off the pill five years later and they're still... Infertile, mm. they've still got PCOS. So we really need to find good doctors that we can send people to. And there's an interesting question here. Are there any natural ways of increasing progesterone? Um, interesting question. <laughs> Vitamin D, getting more sunshine can increase. If you know, if you're vitamin D deficient, if you're sitting out in the sun and looking after your your health, your insulin levels, and your um, uh, vitamin D levels can certainly help increase um, progesterone. Um, what wild yam cream is supposed to help as well? The, and there are some herbal supplements I think that uh, that are similar to progesterone. Be careful, though, you, those sorts of, I mean, apart from the, not the vitamin D so much, but the other hormonal ones, if you're using anything like that, it needs to be used properly. So you can't use it through the whole cycle. You need to use mm -hmm. that only after ovulation or else um, there's a, a, a risk that you'll mess up the the ovulation pattern and the cycle. So, um, yeah, Vitex, I think, is something that's used sometimes. But I, yeah, yeah but I... Some, some, I've heard some naturopaths and maybe even some doctors, I'm not sure, do tend to use that right through the cycle, but I usually recommend that it's only used after ovulation. Okay, and the very last question is here about um, bodies, um, the doctor suggested avoiding coffee and cold food or drinks. Do you agree? Or what other lifestyle change can we do to support our reproductive health and improve the likelihood of conceiving? coffee and cold drinks mm, cold food or drinks oh i'm not sure about the cold i haven't seen any studies on on cold drinks um coffee certainly excess coffee isn't going to be healthy in general uh, for us and as uh, you know everybody's different <laughs> some people can tolerate more coffee than others of course but um if you're having problems with your health or fertility then it's certainly wise to be moderate in things like alcohol intake caffeine intake sugar intake fat of certain types intake um, and no, exercise is important normal weight good sleeping patterns yeah it, it really is it's an old 
it's a very old adage, but all things in moderation just makes so much sense, doesn't it? It does make a lot of sense. And it makes sense to do some basic investigations just to see what sort of um, genetic profile you might have. If you have a family history of diabetes, for example, you are much more likely to have the potential for to have problems with prediabetes, insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So it's good to check it out and find out if you don't, good, you know, you can have more sugar than others <laughs> but um, if you're prone to certain things in your um, genetics then it's worth knowing and worth avoiding what's not good for you fantastic well i think we might have to call it a night there um what i will do though i've just got um a little slide here i think i've got a slide here with our contact details on it, or if I can, I don't know what's going on here. Every time I try and share it, it goes back to the other. I'll just bring that up and leave it sitting on the screen so that people can see it. Um, so if you have any queries and you'd like to contact us, you can contact us either through the Billings Life website on the contact us page or Fertility Pinpoint contact us or email inquiries at billingsovulationmethod.org or also through our Facebook and Instagram private messages. Um, so thank you all very, very much for being with us tonight. Thank you, especially Mary, for giving up your time and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, I might just hand back to Rachel. Rachel, did you have anything else you wanted to add? <laughs> you can't unmute. <laughs> well, maybe I'll just wrap it up then. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, we are going to be having another um, webinar for Natural Fertility Awareness Week, which is the second last week of, I think it starts the 22nd of August this year. So keep an eye out on our website and our uh, social media because we'll be advertising that in the uh, in the months before so if you're interested in joining us again we'd love to have you with us and um take care we hope to see you again soon yeah. thanks everybody thanks lynn thanks rachel you're welcome, Mary. all the best thank you good night good night <laughs>